I love it because it's so truthful to who I was in that moment. And albums like hold that, that, that time and that energy and that feeling. It doesn't tell you who you are, it tells you who you are in a moment. What does being a maverick mean to you? What are you channeling in this role? Today I'm joined by a true icon. And that's a much more ambitious response. This all clearly resonates with so many people. How do you stay true to yourself? Welcome to Mavericks with Ari Melber. Today I am joined by the three-time Grammy winner, singer, songwriter, independent artist, Chance the Rapper. Hey. Hey, thanks for What's being up, here. What's up, man? Thanks for having How me. How you doing? Good, good. I guess we should start with where we're at, which yeah. is at the Blue Note Jazz Festival, yeah. and you just came off headlining the mm -hmm. final night. How's that feel? How'd it go? What does it mean to you? It went really, it went really well. Yeah. It was, uh... I would say one of the performances that I will remember forever. And it just blew my mind. It was very, very like musical, a lot of jamming. I got to come, I came out on stage before my set and did, uh, and I got to freestyle with Rakim. And it was just like super hip hop and super cool to be around some of the people that I admire the most in such a like super iconic time. Like it's the, it's the hip hop 50 every day this year. You gotta just know and sometimes take a second to like be grateful for moments that happen to you. You mentioned Hip Hop 50. It's also Acid Rap 10, right? Yeah. But I wanna start by going even further back. We pulled some real young Chance the Rapper with you and your friend talking about what you wanted to be. I just wanna play this for you and get your thoughts on it. He's a wow. Great. He's been, I've always wanted wow. to be a rapper. And he's, He's made beats for me since like, I don't know, like seventh grade. That's crazy. That was the after school program I used to do. This is a poetry contest. But with music. <laughs> That's cheating low key. Who do you see there? Did that guy know he was gonna make it here? Sounds bad, but yes, that guy definitely saw it. It's like when you're a kid, oh man, like just being a kid, it's nothing like it, man, because you can dream so big. When I was in high school, I was so extroverted and like really trying to build community around what I envisioned as my career path. Like I put out like four mixtapes when I was in high school before I ever made a Chance the Rapper mixtape. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was like just hand to handing and like doing talent shows and creating my own shows and just doing like a lot of stuff like that. Like a lot of that like passion. It's all you can focus on. It's all I can focus on. Cause I didn't do school. I didn't do school for real. Like I just, <laughs> I, I would come sometimes, but like I was always rapping, and I was always doing stuff like that. Poetry. Yeah. I was going to after school programs, but not going to school that day. Like just coming to the after school part, because they had it gave me it gave a lot of us access to so much information around production software and creative writing and I don't know stage presence like that. Open mic. I used to do an open mic at, uh, like every Wednesday. That guy was very, very much so like, I'm trying to be famous, mom. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and getting up on those stages that young, there's levels, right? This was a yeah. much bigger stage and you've been on bigger stages than this one, but how did that prepare you doing that so young? Oh, it helped me a lot because I was performing for very small crowds. Mm -hmm. So I think if you get thrust into shows too early, and you have like a, a huge following by the time you hit the stage, you think about it differently and I feel like it's, it could be more difficult. Whereas like, if you start out small because the smaller shows are the hardest shows, right? Like I played rooms with like 12 people there, but that are like 
150 capacity room, like 12 people looks really, really small and awkward. But I had to train myself to perform the same show for those 12 people as I would if I had the imaginary arena. You know what I mean? And be like connected, engaged, and, and enjoy the fact that that was my job in that moment. And that's easier to convert to a big room. Because the big room, it's hard to even really see all the faces. Mm. But if you can keep that same connectedness from the small show and engage a certain person and make them feel like they're at the show with you and that you guys are singing together and that, like, it's them and you, then it, it's like the rest of the, the it's like, I don't know. It, like, it, it's like, you know what I mean? I do. I mean, you're also talking about how, like, some artists, if they blow up too quick, as you said, their identity, even ego, might be invested in, oh, now I'm in front of this big crowd. They're not ready to experiment or do their first 10 shows, right, when they're that yeah. big. You, people think of you as blowing up young. You had tremendous embrace, fan base, Grammy love, young. But young 20s for you was, you're telling us, over a decade into doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no, I've been I've been recording since I was 13. Yeah. Because my cousin had a studio in his basement. A studio. But like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I was recording, I was making my own, I was I was making chat books, like uh, little books of poetry since I was like in fourth grade, you feel me? So like, I always been a writer and always been a performer as well, because I used to dance. So I feel like, I put out my first full pr put out. I, put, I, I burned my first like a hundred CDs of a original mixtape when I was 14, you know? And, you know, by the time I got Grammys, I was, right, I was 23. So like, yeah, that's like, that's like 10 years into, right. into doing it. And yeah, there's a long time where you, where I was just having to create opportunities. So like renting out a venue and like pre having an agent or pre having management, pre having anything, just like go in and try and like create a show or an event using like this fan base I made out of an open mic, you know, because yeah. I'm young. Yeah. But like doing that over and over and over again and recycling that money and recycling that love and that support, it like created like a storm. Mm -hmm. in Chicago, which mm -hmm. just like kind of just like spiraled out. Yeah. So now 10 years out from Acid Rap. Yeah. What on the project either impresses you, like I had that right, that worked, or would you look at differently today? Because we've we've experienced it and people have, yeah. have their connections to it, but you kind of have this chance to think back on it. Yeah. I mean, what did I, what, what do I think about it? And I was like, that was right. Um, I would say most of it. Yeah? <laughs> it's, been, it's like, Dave has this great quote that he tells me all the time, or that he says all the time, where he says, uh, he says it about specials, but he, when he talks to me about it, he says it's about albums. But he says uh, specials or albums are like yearbook photos. He said it doesn't, it doesn't tell you who you are, it tells you who you are in a moment. And... You can look back at it and love all the things you love about it or point out all the things that you hate about it. But next year, you're going to have to come and take another photo anyway. So it's like, acid rap, I love it because it's so truthful to who I was in that moment. And albums like hold that, that, that time and that energy and that feeling. And I think that's also why a lot of people love it too is because Whatever was going on in their lives mixed with that music created memories forever. So I don't really like look at it as like, like, oh, this is this part of it is absolutely good or absolutely right or absolutely wrong or I should have changed this. It. Like it's a project I made when I was 19 years old. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. And I, I'm curious about that confidence because rap, of course, has such bravado, but you're also seen as very down to earth so you have the confidence but you're also very much you i mean people feel like you come off genuine in your work and your music 
I was looking at Juice where you said, I wonder if I wrote this because it's so crisp. Mm. The most broke is cold, stock broker, winner sold stiff. <laughs> when you look at that now, like you still feel like that line's hard or you're like, that's young me. I feel like that's young me. Like, for, okay. like I feel like, but I mean, that's just, it's like, who I really admire is like fine artists, like painters and, and architects and sculptors and photographers and people that just like make stuff, you know what I mean? Because again, it's like, it's like a timestamp. And so people gain different value out of this individual object and see it from so many different perspectives and, and hold on to what they hold on to from it. But like, the artist might be like, I don't like that piece. <laughs> like, I hate that painting. Yeah. I don't like this photo. Or I don't like this one aspect of it Make is a blemish on the whole thing. To that point, I mean, you had Daylaw here this weekend. There was a time where they didn't want to even perform me, myself, and I, they said, because it just, it took on a life of its own. Yeah. And it was like going around the world, that's the only song people wanted to hear. They're yeah. not at all in their own identity, a pop band, you know? Yeah. And then they said they came back around to it. Um, with what you're doing now, it seems very positive. I think you played highs and lows tonight. Yeah. Right? Um, we have that here. Got to keep your eyes on the road. You feel your back on the ropes. You got to take the highs with the lows. Got to take the highs with the lows. And your more recent work really seems engaged with like what some of us call, you know, adult contemporary hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, are you again kind of young for where you're at? Because Hove is doing that in his 40s. Feels like you're doing it very like early 30s family stuff, but that's true to who you are yeah. right now. Yeah, I think it's just always where I'm at. Like to me, that song's just like probably, if not my greatest verse, one of my one of my greatest verses, because it's like it's real, it's vulnerable, it's very like it's still matter of fact though about how good I am. <laughs> <laughs> like it's all those things like at the same time and to me like that's the best bars you know what i'm saying bars period because our culture is just bars right yeah. it's like everything is bars like rap is bars i could just say s some slick to you and that's bars that's a bar dave dave Chappelle only drops bars he <laughs> has nothing but bars and the bar is like being vulnerable being real, being honest. And like, that song is dark, yo. That song is not like a... It, what like you part is say? dark to you? Oh, the whole thing. But I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a acceptance of the, of, of, of how cyclical joy and hurt are. And so it's like, you gotta take the highs with the lows because as soon as you think you're at your highest point, there's going to be some lows. And the same thing if you at your lowest low point, there's going to be some highs soon. But it's also like speaking about drugs, speaking about, you know, um, you know, vices overall, just like it's saying in the most me right now way, it's OK to not be OK. Right. Mm. And so like when I listen to the song, I find both weakness and strength in it because it's just like, I don't know, it's honest. Yeah. I have a little bit of a montage we have with just some of your music, so I want to play that and also build on what you're saying, which is whether you think that kids growing up on your music today and other contemporaries are getting a healthier or wider view about what you just mentioned, which is what life's really like or mental health and a different vibe because back in the day, a lot of that stuff was so stigmatized, right? It either was very much a, a subgenre or not even a part of a lot of music, it's definitely not a lot of mainstream hip hop. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious your thoughts on that. Plus, uh, we're just gonna take a look at a couple other tracks. Yeah. 
Cause it's so crisp The most broken Scout stock broker When I saw this You sound like What the gospel cry I got so tired Singing this crazy Daily basis So I gotta try it You my dream Catch a dream Team, team, captain Matter of fact I ain't seen you in a minute Let me take my butt to try it. So anywhere you wanna go <laughs> Three videos Yeah You know where that first video was? No It was at the Venice Biennale one of the world's largest and most prestigious art fairs. Oh, it's right. And it happens every other year in Venice, Italy. And uh, me and Joey Badass and a, a bunch of my homies uh, went out there and kicked it with some of the top artists in the world. So many, so many like real, real, like heavy, heavy, like fine artists, black fine artists. And they were like, the talk of the town. Like, it was like, it was literally, it felt like some very, like, Harlem Renaissance type stuff. And we documented it for that video for the highs and the lows uh, as a part of, like, this, this visual musical project that I'm working on. And I feel like I get a lot of the same vibes from being at this Napa Blue Note Jazz Fest Swagathon, because <laughs> there's so much, there's so many dope, important black leaders in this business. And, and it just feels cool to like always bring a little bit of ruggedness to every space. Yeah. So like going to Venice, you know, like <laughs> being a, a, a group of, like a, a big group of black people, like moving through that space and like recognizing the spaces that we didn't have access to and also understanding that a lot of those spaces were spaces that we didn't need access to because we were carrying that light of that festival was like a like a, a metaphor for how this stuff works and i feel like the thing that i'm most proud about in the new music is that it's very truthful and it's very like ruggedly honest and you can feel the community of high level artists and thought leaders contributing to making that project mm -hmm. work. Well, and you seem really intentional about working across different types of art. I mean, in this, just in this brief conversation, you're talking about Chappelle, who's curating this with Glasper, that's comedy, jazz, visual art, you've cited. This whole place we're in is, is as you said, going to a, a space that may not have always been as accessible yeah. and remixing that. And then of course you have this work you're doing where you guys were in Ghana. Yeah. And next you're taking the yeah. to Jamaica. Tell us about yeah. that festival and what that means to you. Again, yeah. in a space where in the, a lot of times artists aren't in charge of these things, right? Yeah. You seem to be changing that. So yeah, tell me totally. about that too. Yeah. No, yeah, the Black Star Line Fest uh, was so beautiful. And I had just gotten to uh, I just I just visited Ghana for the first time, like maybe a year before we put the festival on. So, you know, being in Africa with, you know, some of the top artists from the States and from the UK and from across Africa and, you know, being in community with all those artists and like having like a, a safe and free and the autonomy of the festival. How you were just talking about how there's artists that like get to like, how we're in position to curate and produce and create festivals on our own now. Like that's, that was that vibe. I mean, that's literally what it was. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a black festival in, in Africa with T-Pain and Erica Badu and Dave Chappelle and me and Vic and all these people, but it was like, how we wanted to put it together. We wanted to be free. We wanted to be educational. We wanted to be multi-day. We wanted to be, you know, based in something, based in Garveyism, based in Pan-Africanism, based in, you know, um, I'm not gonna say all my politics because there's a lot of political people that watch this show, but like, you know what, y'all know what I be on. Yeah. But, but like, uh, yeah, just being in that, it's like, it's again, it's like, it's a, it's, it's a part of, a larger renaissance that's just happening. Yeah, well you talk about politics and we don't have to go deep on it, but your fluency with it, yeah. your family's connection to the Obamas, 
Yeah. I think you've gotten shout outs from both Obamas. That's a lot. You know, two Obamas. Yeah. Uh, Barack and Michelle. Yeah. And two time. Two time. Then, then you have, of course, the comeback Barack clip, yeah. which will remind people of that. Emmy that goes nominated. Yeah. <laughs> you get the Emmy for that. So, obviously, some of that has to just be organic, but some of it comes from what your early fluency and coming out of Chicago. What, is, what does that mean to you over time, being connected to, as you talk about, reviving and empowering Black voices in art and beyond? What does that mean to you? Yeah, man. I feel like. The reason why I like the the term renaissance is because it's like we're it's almost beyond elevating. It's almost like we're abolishing and mm. like we're going into a whole new thought process. And I think that's like what it takes is like history is history and it's like it's what we learn from. But like I don't I don't know that the political systems as they're set up right now or how they've been set up for since the inception of America is like, is it one, not working obviously, but two, like, I don't know how long it's gonna stay that way. Because mm -hmm. we're just all not at our own fault, losing faith and belief in the integrity of the systems that are at play. And so, like, political to me always just has a negative <laughs> connotation to it. But I believe in like, political work that's like getting stuff done for real. You know what I mean? Well, like, do you think from your from your experience with your father, being close to it, you that made you like that's called even more realistic or pessimistic or no? I think like maybe when I was young it made me more optimistic. Mm. But like the older you get and the more you understand just the bureaucracy and like how like stagnant stuff has been for a lot of groups, but definitely for black folks in America. Well, Bring Back Barack also was that thing where you tapped into a feeling where it was like, and this is true in art too, right? Mm -hmm. It's really easy to, for people to weigh in or criticize in the moment. And then mm -hmm. when you get distance, or of course, when something fades away, not that it has yeah. to die, but just yeah. like you have that distance. People go, oh no, that was great. It's like the way we sometimes hold up and worship the classics or yeah. unfortunately sometimes people have to be gone. Yeah. And then they say, oh, now I'm listening to Nipsey or I'm learning about this. And you say, yeah. what about when they were here? You know? That's super real. Yeah. yeah. The last thing I, I want to show you video wise is just the, the funny chance because again, you've subverted a lot of what people think about what a rapper has to be. There's these whole other dimensions you've been confident enough or open enough to share, right? Which is not at least 90s rapper. Yeah. Stuff. So this is just some funny stuff we found. <laughs> okay, I'm here with King Turn Around so I can get a name. Yes, that is a S, a K, and a J all next to each other, so that's a nope. Uh, we're in love. <laughs> and with love, there are no rules. They're both from Chicago. Those are my people. Oh, yeah? Yes, I see them back. Hi, welcome to another edition of Between Two Ferns. Uh, my guest I forgot is that I did this. Chance the Rapper. Not Chance Hi. the Rapper. You're friends with Kanye West. That's the joke. I don't like that joke. <laughs> you put the rapper in the name, which always seemed like a bit of a, its own gag, mm -hmm. um, but it, do you have to add something else? Is it also Chance? Comedian or the artist or I love, this other party. I love comedic acting. I love I love funny stuff. <laughs> I'm from Chicago, so a lot of my friends grew up doing Second City and stuff like that. And uh, I used to do improv at uh, Thunderdome. So, and I just grew up loving SNL. So like that was just like always a given. When I was coming up rapping, one of my goals was to make it on SNL through really? raps. Yes, but dude, that's different than most rappers, don't you think? Nah, it's not different than MC Hammer. So my older cousin was a big Hammer fan. Hammer's just a little bit before my time, mm -hmm. right? I was born in 93. So when Hammer did SNL, he became uh, the first rapper to do double duty on the show. So he was the host and in all the sketches, and he also performed twice. And so I had a video cassette that my cousin handed down to me of his SNL thing that he had taped. And I used to just watch it all the time. And I was like, I'm gonna do this one day. And so uh, 
every time I came up to SNL, I was always begging to be in sketches. Like when I was coming on as a musical guest and eventually I got hosting duty, but they wouldn't let me rap. Oh, so you pushed for that. And then, and then why do they only want you to host? Just to focus? Well, Lauren just said that, it, yeah, exactly. So yeah, Lauren was like, you need to focus on the, on the show. So what was awesome was that when I got to focus on the show, I got to get back into my old writing bag and I wrote five sketches for the show and three of them made it to air, I think, or two of them made it to air, one of them made it to dress rehearsal. But uh, the famous, uh, the Steve Harvey illegitimate son, Family Feud episode, that was me and my homie Reese. And, uh, and, the, and the Batman, we gotta, we gotta do something about Batman. That's, those two are, uh, but yeah, no, I love comedy. I love film overall. And uh, yeah, it's always fun to just like go and play, like do do some do some funny acting, do some some yeah. games on Wild and Out. Those are my people. Yeah, no, and that comes through, right? Which again, I think is just different because you're sharing the, the multiple sides you have yourself. While you can still go up and rock a crowd, um, I'd love to before we lose you. And again, amazing to get you right off the headline uh -huh, set. I'd love to do a what we call a lightning round. So it's like in a in a word or a sentence. Yeah. And it's just whatever comes to mind. I didn't sign a record deal because... I was scared. <laughs> uh, the best part about being an independent artist is... Control. The most challenging part is... Money. I knew I had more work to do when... I had a kid. I knew I'd made it when... I met Kanye West. Someone I want to collaborate with who I haven't yet is? Ooh, Stevie Wonder. Uh, this is like a word or a sentence common. One of the greatest to ever do it. Dave Chappelle. Mentor. Vic Mensa. Broski. Lil Wayne. Oh, the best rapper alive. Okay, for real, that's how you feel? Yeah. Okay. You just question Wayne? Oh, my question. Okay, okay. My questioning. He's not even Chicago though, you know. Lil Wayne is the best rapper alive. SZA. Friend, great friend. Beyonce. Go. <laughs> All right, these are final three. Failure means? Quitting. Success means? Finishing. Being a maverick means? Dark Nabisky. <laughs> Chance the Rapper, thank you so I much, know. man.